All right, everyone, thanks for coming to today's seminar in our numerical analysis seminar series. Today's speaker is uh, Dave Shirkoff, um, who is a associate professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology. He received his PhD at uh, MIT, uh, where he worked with Ruben Rosales. Um, and he followed that with a postdoc at McGill, uh, where that's where we met. And he worked with JC Nov and uh, Rustem Choksi. His uh, research interests uh, are mainly in uh, numerical PDEs and analysis of PDEs and variational methods. And today he will talk to us about the expli implicit explicit stability and applications to dispersive shallow water equations. Uh, Dave, thanks so much for agreeing to contribute to our seminar series. And please go ahead. Oh, well, th thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation, uh, Mohammed. Um, I'm really happy to uh, to be here uh, speaking today. I, you know, obviously, I wish I would get to meet everybody in person. Um, so I'm uh, currently at uh, CMU this year on sabbatical. So I I would just like to acknowledge um, my host CMU and uh, the NSF for funding. Okay, so I'll uh, just before I get into the the talk, uh, I would just like to acknowledge my collaborators. So, um, so I have two collaborators at NGIT, my colleague Wu, Wu Young Choi and my student Lin Wan Feng, uh, regarding this project. And uh, parts of this project uh, had uh, my other collaborators, Dong Zhu, who is now at uh, Cal State uh, LA, uh, Benny Seibold, who's at Temple, and then my PhD advisor Ruben, uh, who's at MIT. And we're, we're located uh, just about 20 to 30 minutes outside of New York in Newark, uh, New Jersey. So that's where NJIT is. So we're, we're fairly centrally located on the uh, Northeast. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk about some stability theory uh, that we've been working on, and then I'll get into some applications and uh, finish up with the dispersive shallow water equations, which are some recent uh, problems that we've been thinking about. Uh, so, so I'll start off with, uh, I like starting off with the simplest uh, possible situation, which is if I just give you an ODE, uh, which is a linear ODE. Uh, so this, this is uh, a matrix L here that's N by N. And I just ask, okay, how, let's time advance this. Uh, so time step it, time integrate it. Uh, how, how might we do it? Well, if L is stiff, then one thing we could try is uh, split L up into an implicit part uh, AU and an explicit part BU. So in other words, we, we take L and we write it as A plus B, where AU will be treated implicitly and BU will be treated explicitly. Now, obviously this decomposition of L into an implicit and explicit part, it's not unique. In fact, given an L, I can pick A any way I would like, and then B is automatically determined. So in other words, you know the the space of ways that you can decompose L into A plus A, A plus B is, you know, it's essentially the set of all matrices A, and the convention typically when dealing with implicit explicit methods is that you take all the stiff terms in the matrix L and you put them in an A, and then you leave the non-stiff terms and you put them in B. Now, what what is an example of an implicit explicit method? Well, um, I wrote down you know, a first order Euler scheme on the right here. So uh, N is uh, the nth time step. And so you see here that uh, to evaluate the explicit term, it, it essentially is just a function evaluation. So it's, you know, in the language of linear algebra, it's just a matrix vector product. Whereas the implicit part uh, has U of N plus one, and so if you want to compute and solve U of n plus one, you ultimately have to solve a linear system. And so the advantage of treating some terms implicitly is that implicit treatments give you stability typically, um, but they're more expensive usually because you have a linear solve or a nonlinear solve in some cases. Whereas explicit treatments uh, can often be done fast. They can be done in parallel. They usually just involve function evaluations and uh, so they're efficient, but they are not necessarily stable. And so IMEX schemes are an attempt at trying to gain some stability benefits while leaving the difficult terms treated explicitly. 
and they've been around for a long time. So one, one way that we got interested in this are situations where for computational purposes, uh, B is difficult to treat implicitly and so B might be stiff. So for instance, one of the examples I like is the variable coefficient diffusion problem. So this is the diffusion equation, du dt is equal to a variable coefficient uh, inside. Uh, there's, so this x right here is taking the spatial derivative. And so one thing you might try and do is split this variable coefficient diffusion part up into a constant coefficient diffusion alpha plus a remaining term. And so the alpha uxx uh, that's constant coefficient, and so that's something you might want to try and treat implicitly. The variable co coefficient diffusion is now d of x minus alpha, and you may want to treat this explicitly. Now, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that this uh, variable coefficient diffusion term that's being treated explicitly, it has two derivatives, and so it itself is stiff, and so now you're treating a stiff term explicitly, and so you're hoping that you won't incur a small time step restriction due to treating a term that has two derivatives explicitly. And so what has to happen? Well, you have to make sure that the implicit term here gives you enough stability so that it stabilizes the unstable uh, dynamics uh, that, that occur from the explicit treatment of this variable coefficient diffusion problem. The advantage is that you're treating constant coefficient diffusion implicitly. So if, if, for instance, the diffusion coefficient was depending on space and time, or maybe even worse, was nonlinear, nonlinearly dependent, like we'll see later, you know, you don't want to have to, you know, build up an implicit linear solver at every time step. You know, maybe you want to try and cook up one linear solver that's completely optimized to handle, you know, one constant coefficient operator, and then you know, ride that through every time step. Now, it, it was observed uh, quite early, this goes back to the 70s, that if you pick alpha large enough, you can always make Euler methods, so first order time stepping schemes of this form, stable. And since that uh, time, um, there's been numerous observations, uh, many papers that have observed this uh, for a variety of different PDEs uh, for both first and second order methods. Now, one of the reasons we got interested in looking at time stepping by itself, uh, this goes back to uh, reformulations of the Navier-Stokes equations. So the Navier-Stokes equations uh, look, look like this. And it turns out that you can reformulate the Nav Navier-Stokes equations into an alternative uh, form, uh, sometimes called a pressure Poisson equation. Sometimes these are called extended uh, PDEs. Uh, so this is a, an evolution equation for the momentum, and then you have a Poisson equation for the pressure. Uh, what's not trivial about this system right here are how you handle the boundary conditions. But once the PDE is in this form, uh, time stepping this form of the Navier-Stokes equation, essentially once you discretize in space, amounts to solving an index one differential algebraic equation as opposed to an index two differential algebraic equation. So that's one of the advantages. And this form right here is, you know, very amenable to um, semi-implicit or IMEX time-stepping schemes. And so what you might want to do is treat the Laplacian term implicitly and treat the pressure term and the nonlinear terms explicitly. And so for certain ranges of the Reynolds numbers, this can be an attractive uh, approach to time-stepping the Navier-Stokes equations. And so uh, what we observed when um, applying time-stepping schemes of this form to this to this PDE was that for multi-step schemes like Euler methods, they were always stable and second order methods were always stable. And then third order methods were sometimes stable. Um, sometimes you'd lose stability when you changed, for instance, the domain geometry uh, or the parameters in the problem. Uh, fourth order schemes are never stable. And so it was sort of odd that, you know, the third order schemes are sometimes stable and sometimes not stable. Now, this is reminiscent of what, what's known as the Dahlquist barrier, that you know, there's a fundamental change in stability when you go from second order to third order multi-step methods. Uh, but this system right here is a little bit different because we're treating some terms implicitly and some terms explicitly. And so it's a little bit of a puzzle, you know, what's going on? 
And so that led us to sort of abstractize the problem a little bit and then just look at the, the you know, the, the simplified structure of the problem to see what, what was happening. So the, the first half of the talk, I'll focus on IMEX schemes that have the following form. So du dt is equal to au plus bu. We're going to look at au implicitly and bu explicitly. We're going to restrict ourselves to just the case where a and B are matrices. So for instance, this could be a method of lines discretization of a PDE. So I'm thinking of discretizing space first. And then now we've got a system of ODEs in time that are coupled together. I want to leave the situation where B and A are both potentially stiff. So I'm not going to think of B necessarily as being non-stiff. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume that A is symmetric, negative definite. So it's kind of like the Laplacian. So the prior examples fit into this framework that I'm talking about. Now, this symmetric negative definite constraint can be relaxed a little bit, um, but it'll just make the calculation cleaner. And what I'd like to do is try and discuss uh, sufficient conditions for um, unconditional stability. So this is going to be stability independent of how large one takes the time step. So it's a fairly strong condition. Um, similarly, we'll also look at necessary conditions, and it's going to turn out that the sufficient, there's going to be a little bit of a gap. So we're going to try to come up with a theory that is workable, that can be used by practitioners. And so uh, we're going to relax uh, the situation so that the sufficient and necessary conditions are not completely identical to each other. We'll also look at introducing a new family of time stepping coefficients as a way to help stabilize certain classes of problems. And then later on in the talk, we'll look at some examples. So um, I'll first recap uh, just the standard ODE theory, uh, stability theory that we often teach in upper year uh, undergraduate numerics classes or, or uh, graduate numerics classes. So, so when you look at numerical stability for a linear differential equation, um, the situation can actually be characterized uh, quite nicely and exactly. And so the way that one can do it is that you decouple the stability uh, analysis into two, two pieces. One is you look at the eigenvalues of the matrix A and you define the set of eigenvalues. So that's, that's just the spectrum of the matrix A. So this is a property only of the matrix A. So on the right here, we have a property that depends only on A. Um, then on the left, we look at the scalar ODE. So U is now a scalar and we have a parameter lambda and we look at whether the dynamics for the scalar ODE are stable or not. So in other words, we apply the time-stepping scheme like Euler's method or backward differentiation equations to the, the scalar ODE. We define uh, the time step K times lambda as a single parameter. And then we define a set in the complex plane so that uh, the ODE, when we apply the time-stepping scheme to the ODE, uh, the dynamics are stable. So in other words, the solution stay bounded or decay to zero. And so this defines a set in the complex plane. And this depends only, the set in the complex plane, uh, math cal A here, depends only on the time stepping scheme. It's, it does not depend on the problem. It doesn't depend on the matrix A. And then stability uh, is, is characterized as whether when you take the eigenvalues of your matrix A and you multiply them by the time step, do they lie in this geometric entity, this, this object A in the complex plane? And so what's nice about this approach is that uh, it allows you to decouple the problem into something that depends only on A and something that, that depends only on the time-stepping scheme. It allows you to design time-stepping or integration approaches that work for entire classes of problems. So for instance, if you know that the matrix A that, you're, that your problem is drawn from has a certain generic structure, then you can look at time-stepping schemes that are stable for that class of problems. And uh, unconditional stability is relatively easy to analyze. So for instance, A must contain a cone. Now, the difficulties of applying this type of approach where you decouple the problem from the time-stepping scheme, if you try and apply that same idea, even to this linear problem where A and B are matrices, the problem is, is that A and B gener generally don't commute. And so, uh, it's not necessarily true anymore that the problem can be decomposed in this way, at least in a simple way. Um, and so the necessary and sufficient conditions uh, are more difficult. And uh, what we would like to do is try to mimic this type of approach where you have a, a diagrammatic theory uh, that allows you to devise unconditionally stable schemes, but one that can also apply to scenarios where A and B don't commute. 
So what is, what is the idea? Now, we would like to ultimately boil things down into a scalar uh, model equation, which is one thing that is often done in the literature. Um, but the scalar model equation is not necessarily justified uh, for matrices that commute. And so what we're going to do is we're going to show how you can justify that scalar, that scalar pro the scalar ODE test problem uh, for, matri for matrices that don't necessarily commute. Uh, so I'll just define a few terms. So when I say uh, multi-step methods or linear multi-step methods, I'm talking about scenarios where you basically discretize the time derivative as just a, a linear combination of uh, function evaluations at various time steps. David, so may I stop you and ask you a question? Oh, um, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll address this later, but uh, yeah, actually a couple of questions. One is, um, what's the advantage of IMAX over like a fully implicit method? I mean, in the in the mm -hmm. old, in the matrix, it, it, I don't see a big advantage. And maybe the next point, um, maybe you can clarify your assumptions. Are you gonna assume that A and B are diagonalizable or something? Because that, that, that scalar theory that you mentioned is only valid for diagonalizable matrices, right? Yeah. Right, right, yeah. So, okay, so, so I'll answer the the second question first. Okay. Uh, so we've assumed that the matrix A is symmetric. Okay, so, fair enough. So yeah, A is yeah. going to be diagonalizable, and it's okay. got uh, eigenvalues which are strictly negative. Uh -huh. So so that's A. For B, I'm not making any assumptions. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So B B could be non-diagonalizable for or or any you know multiplication of of A and B could be non-diagonalizable. So for instance, L might not necessarily be diagonalizable. Sure. The original L. Um, Okay, your, your question about whether, um, what are the advantages of IMEX methods where you treat only some terms implicitly and other terms you leave explicitly? Well, if you have fast linear algebra solvers that can handle, say, a portion of uh, your, your matrix L efficiently and you want to leverage those solvers, then what you do is you basically pull out the part of L that you can treat efficiently and then you know hit it with those fast linear algebra solvers, yeah. and then that leaves all the other stuff be. Um, but but you're right. There's, you know, with with like modern day preconditioning, uh, you know, there there is a question on whether you're just better off treating A plus B fully implicitly. Uh, okay. We we see this later in the dispersive shallow water equations where there's an argument to do both, and one thing that we observe is that every for multi step methods, what's interesting is Every time you take one time step, you're only inverting A once. Yep. Whereas if you were to treat A plus B implicitly, fully implicitly, yep. um, uh, then uh, well, you you may um, you you may need to uh, do some more sophisticated solver, for instance. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. So why you're taking the constant coefficient part as a? So you, you, the idea that you can use like some efficient solvers there. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a common theme in this, in 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 this talk. Uh, but the the general theory here doesn't make any um, assumptions about the structure of a. It's just it just assumes that there's that you've got some some splitting, and then okay. if the splitting satisfies some abstract condition, then then you'll be stable. And then we'll show later how we can satisfy that type of condition. OK, perfect. Thanks. I think I have another question, but you may answer it soon. So I'll, I'll just wait till the end. OK, sure. Feel free to interrupt me. Thanks. Yeah. OK. Um, OK, so uh, so when I say multi-step methods, we time discretize the PDE uh, just l using um, linear combinations of the time of the solution at different time steps. Uh, this is in contrast to Runge-Kutta methods, where when you take one time step of a Runge-Kutta method, you actually have to compute a whole bunch of intermediate stage values, which are then used to update the one time step, and then the intermediate stage values are discarded. So multi-step methods are very, they, they are efficient in that, you know, you every implicit solve, or every, every time step only requires one implicit solve. Uh, one example is uh, implicit Euler. Um, another example are the backward differentiation formulas. I've just written down the coefficients here, uh, but BDF methods are also extremely common, extremely popular. Now, when I talk about unconditional stability um, for, for this talk, th there are other notions of stability in, in numerical PDEs, but uh, when I say unconditional stability, 
I just I'm just asking for the vector u of n to remain uniformly bounded for all n and and arbitrary time steps k. So in other words, it doesn't matter what time step k you pick when you look at the iterates, the u of n's defined by this linear update rule. So you can think of this time discretization almost as like a discrete dynamical system. So you know, for each fixed value of k, for each time step k, you can compute this you know, linear update uh, and look at the sequence of u of n's that are generated. Uh, and then you just ask that those u of n's stay bounded, bounded below some constant. And you want that constant to be independent of the time step k that you pick. So, so in other words, there's, there exists a constant that does not depend on the time step k uh, such that u of n is you know, less than or equal to the constant, constant times the initial data, for instance. So if you double the initial data, you'll double the values of n. But Now, this is not a trivial property um, because this explicit term is destabilizing in some sense. So it's, it's, this is demanding a lot. So unconditional stability is sort of not something that's, uh, uh, that's, that's necessarily simple. Um, Unconditional stability depends simultaneously on the coefficients a, b, and c, which are those are the coefficients uh, required by the time stepping scheme, and also the matrices a and b. So, in other words, if you had a, if 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 whether the scheme is unconditionally stable or not is a binary variable, one or zero, like yes, yes it is, or no it isn't, the answer depends simultaneously on these five these five quantities here. Now, when A and B uh, commute and are, say, simultaneously diagonalizable, then you can replace A and B with scalars, um, and then you end up with a linear update rule. But we're, but we're not necessarily assuming that here. And, um, and you, you can think about this in a couple of ways. So you know, when, you devise this, when you devise an IMEX scheme, one thing that you might do is pick A and B at the start, and then you know, apply a time stepping scheme and hopefully ask that it's stable. But but ultimately, when you are looking at developing an IMEX scheme, you know, you do have some flexibility in choosing A and B. Um, now, in, now, we're also going to loosen that a little bit and say that uh, in some cases, we can actually gain stability and efficiency if we're willing to simultaneously pick A and B and then also the coefficients A, B, and C. So uh, let's talk about how we uh, get at the uh, stability diagram and then how we actually connect it to cases when the matrices A and B don't commute. So, so this is just a linear update scheme. And so the question of stability is independent of F. So in other words, whether we're unconditionally stable or not, uh, I, should have, I should have added a caveat here that F is zero. So in other words, when are the homogeneous dynamics stable? Uh, so we basically plug in a solution, uh, u is equal to z to the n times v. And uh, if you plug this into the dynamics, then you get a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. So the uh, dynamics, the growth factors z, they grow uh, according to solutions uh, of this nonlinear eigenvalue problem, where a, b, and c are polynomials that depend on the coefficients of your time-stepping scheme. These coefficients and the polynomials are not independent. Uh, they, they have to be chosen so that your time stepping scheme is consistent in the sense that, you know, it accurately uh, reproduces solutions of the differential equations when you have small delta t's. And so the, the relationship between the, the a, b's and c's, those are known as the order conditions. And so there are order conditions in which a, b, and c must adhere to. Now, if we could compute uh, all the eigenvalues of this problem star, uh, and if all of the eigenvalues had magnitude less than one, then that would be sufficient to ensure uh, stability for a given time step. If the eigenvalues were, if all the eigenvalues of this problem star here had magnitude less than one for all values of k, then we would then be unconditionally stable. And we would ideally like to uh, avoid solving this nonlinear eigenvalue problem. And so, you know, can we bound the location of the eigenvalues? And so to do that, uh, imagine just for uh, a moment that we had an eigen uh, eigenvector v and we dotted star through by v. Um, and actually, we're going to also allow for the possibility of this extra factor minus a to some arbitrary power. 
why why do we add this extra factor here? Well, it gives us a little bit more flexibility. This this sort of mimics a Sobolev space norm. Um, so so there's so this essentially just gives us more flexibility at the end of the day. Um, that will actually be somewhat useful. So we dot through by essentially v, and we end up getting this uh, scalar polynomial equation, where the variable y in the scalar polynomial equation is is given by this something that looks like a Rayleigh quotient. Uh, so it's determined, in, it's given in terms of v, and then uh, a variable mu, which is also given essentially like a Rayleigh quotient uh, in terms of v. Now the problem is, is we don't actually know what the the vector v is. So uh, we we just imagine that we we had it, and if we had it, if we knew what v was exactly, we could compute the y, we could compute mu, and then we could solve this polynomial system here for the z's. And so so that would that would essentially give us a a road towards determining whether the growth factors of the linear update rule. Uh, we're stable or not. So if all the solutions of this equation double star had modulus less than one, then that would be a sufficient condition for stability. Now, the pro so the problem is we don't know what y and mu are uh, specifically. Uh, however, we general we know something about what y and mu are. Uh, so we don't know what the, the actual individual values of y and mu are for all the eigenvectors, but we can actually bound the sets that y and mu live in. So, so for instance, um, if you look at y, uh, because v because a, uh, negative a is positive definite, um, y is a number that ranges over the entire negative real axis. So uh, what we do is we look at the scalar test problem, which is double star, and we define the set of points mu in the complex plane so that double star is stable. So in other words, we we, we solve this equation double star. Uh, for all the values mu in the complex plane, uh, so that you get stable roots of this, or stable solutions of this uh, polynomial equation, and they're stable for all y's less than zero. So that's that's how we're going to define the unconditional stability region. Um, and so what, what we're going to like is we're going to want to try to have the mu's that come from the eigenvectors live in this set. So this set D uh, this set D basically characterizes when solutions of this, this model problem here have stable roots for arbitrary values of Y, which are the values uh, when delta T, or sorry, the time step ranges over the negative real axis, or sorry, the positive real axis. Now, it turns out, uh, and this is a theorem that I'll say a little bit more about momentarily, but it turns out that the set D can be completely characterized for certain classes of time stepping schemes. Uh, it char it's characterized in the worst possible case when y goes to negative infinity. So, in other words, this is sort of like looking at the dynamics defined when your time step delta t is infinitely large. And so, the 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 IMEX scheme actually makes sense as a dynamical system, or as a you know as an, an iterative method of when delta t is formally set to infinity. And it turns out that when delta t is or k is set formally to infinity, that's actually when you have the most dangerous dynamics. Uh, there is some similarity to this type of approach uh, uh, from other uh, other works uh, in the literature as well. And so there's a theorem here that we can actually characterize what this d is exactly. Uh, so so basically, just the take home point of the slide is that we have a formula for d. Um, for some standard well-known schemes, like for instance, semi-implicit uh, semi backward differentiation formulas. And uh, the proof of the theorem is that you, you can actually write D as a conformal mapping of a triangle. So that's, that's essentially how you get the exact formulas for D. Um, so that's, that's what the shape D is here. Now, I'll just say a few things about the proof. So, I won't dwell too much on the slides, but the um, the set the set D here you can write it essentially as the intersection of a family of sets that come from solving polynomial poly systems of polynomial equations with variables y and mu, um, and so the the proof is really done in two steps. So one is that you essentially show that 
when you set delta t to infinity or k to infinity, um, you can characterize exactly what the, the set d minus infinity is through this conformal mapping. And then what you do is you then show that if mu is in the d minus infinity, then it's in dy for all y, um, essentially. So that's the two-step proof. And um, I, I go into a little bit more detail here on you know, how you get the conformal mapping. Essentially, it's a you're solving a polynomial equation. So in, in the case when you set delta t to infinity, the polynomial equation simplifies. So you can solve for all the roots. You can characterize the roots um, of the or the, the roots of the polynomial is, you know, which are the growth factors of your of your system. And uh, if you characterize them in a certain way, then you can show that the unit circle in one space corresponds to a triangle in this conformal mapping space. Um, and so that's I, that's essentially what the the idea of the approach is. So if you conform if you find the right conformal mapping, then um, the values of mu that give you stable roots turn out to be a triangle in this uh, in this other space. So so I won't I won't say too much more about the the proof, but okay. And then the second part is that you you show that. Um, that in the conformally mapped space, the triangle uh, contains uh, basically the root locus is always bounded away from the triangle. So, okay, so those are some more technical points on the proof. Okay, so how do you actually use these diagrams in practice and what do they look like? So, so essentially, what you need is you need this Riley quotient. So, the Riley quotient that defines the mu's you need to be inside the unconditional stability region. Now, the Riley quotient can be rewritten. You can essentially just normalize the denominator of the Riley quotient to equal one. And so the Riley quotient uh, looks something like this. But the problem is, is we don't know what the eigenvectors are. So if we knew what the eigenvectors are, then this, this, uh, this bracket here would just be individual points that essentially, they're, they're, it would just be like the uh, Riley quotient that gives you the mu's evaluated at the different eigenvectors. So we don't know what it is, um, but you can you can basically bound uh, the region where the the eigenvectors, when plugged into this expression, live. And so what you do is you just allow v to vary over all possible vectors. So in other words, you look at the Riley quotient as v varies over all possible vectors. And so you you introduce a new set, which is this WP. And then if WP lies inside the unconditional stability region, then that means the Riley quotient evaluated all the eigenvectors lies in the, in the unconditional stability region. And just to, to back everything up again, what that means is every eigenvector would give you a value of mu such that when you plugged into that polynomial equation, you get stable roots for all values of K. And so that, that gives you a sufficient condition uh, for unconditional stability. So this, this gives you a sufficient condition for unconditional stability. And then you can also show that there's a related condition, which is a necessary condition. You just look at the generalized eigenvalues of A and B, and it turns out that the generalized eigenvalues of A and B must lie in this stability region. Otherwise, you're definitely not unconditionally stable. So, so there's a little bit of a gap here. So you need this w, WP set to be inside this unconditional stability region. That, that would give you unconditional stability. And you, you better have the eigenvector or the eigenvalues, the generalized eigenvalues of A and B inside this unconditional stability region. Otherwise, you're definitely not unconditionally stable. And so there's a little bit of a gap between these two statements here. And you know, what is that gap? Well, it turns out that the set WP can be related to the, the numerical range or the, the field of values uh, through a change of variables. Um, and so and so it's interesting to look at what the set WP is. So if the matrices are normal and commute, then this, this set WP is just the convex hull of the eigenvalues. And so this gap here between the necessary and sufficient conditions um, starts, to be, starts to be small uh, when um, the matrices are, say, they commute and are normal. Um, and this sufficient condition is weaker than some others that were also used in the literature. 
Okay, so we now have a condition which we can use to ensure that a scheme is unconditionally stable. Um, I also want to highlight that you know, these semi-implicit backward differentiation formulas, what do the unconditional stability regions look like? Um, so this is the unit circle. This is for Euler's method. So this is you know, backward Euler and forward Euler for the A and B matrices. Um, it then has this other teardrop shape for second order. And then for third order, something actually, well, second order and third order, there's some fundamental differences. One is that you end up getting um, a point at the location one and then third order, uh, the, the region is actually strictly bounded away from the point one. And that, that's going to become important later. Um, you'll notice that they start to shrink. And so the fact that the this, this shapes shrink, these are all plotted on the same scale. So the fact that these regions of unconditional stability shrink uh, means, that, um, uh, means that you start to lose stability as you go to higher order, which is uh, a common theme. There's usually a trade-off as you go to higher order your schemes become less stable. Uh, and now it does turn out that you can actually cook up uh, other IMEX schemes. Uh, the IMEX schemes can be defined through coefficients of the polynomials A, B, and C. Uh, and so it turns out that you can cook up schemes. Uh, this is a one parameter family of schemes indexed by delta. Uh, you can, if you cook up these schemes, then um, these schemes can actually give you lots of really good stability. So this was something that that we did. Uh, the, key, the schemes are zero stable. Um, for R equals two, there's some similarities with these schemes uh, in a prior paper by uh, from 2003. Uh, the unconditional stability regions for these schemes, uh, they start to get bigger and bigger as delta goes smaller and smaller. And asymptotically, we can show that they approach a circle. Now, there is a downside. So as you gain unconditional stability, you do actually lose um, uh, you do lose conditioning in the problem. So the, you know you don't want to take these to be infinitely large, for instance. Uh, but they give you some flexibility that can stabilize schemes that would not necessarily be stable when you had uh, you know, backward differentiation formulas. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get into some examples. So I, I like to give this as just a really simple idealized example. Uh, so let's suppose you start time-stepping this scheme, this, this ODE, du dt equals minus 10 u. Um, and let's suppose that you want to you want to split it so that minus u is implicitly implicit and minus nine u is explicit. So the implicit part is nine times smaller than the explicit part. And so you wouldn't necessarily think that the scheme could potentially be stable uh, because you know you're you're treating a term explicitly that is in some sense bigger than the term that you're treating implicitly. Um, but okay, so I mean this is actually a case where trivially the the matrices are single. Point, single entry, so you know they commute and everything, and you know you don't really need the full theory. But um, the numerical range is one point minus nine, um, and so you can actually pick a delta. So you can pick that you can you know tune the time stepping scheme uh, so that the unconditional stability region that you have includes the point minus nine. And so if you pick delta equals to zero decimal zero four and you plug it into the time stepping schemes. You know, defined by these polynomials, you get a time stepping scheme that will guarantee that this ODE is stable, is unconditionally stable, it's stable with arbitrarily large time steps. Now, it might not necessarily be that accurate for large time steps, but you won't necessarily you won't blow up. Okay, so uh, another another example is one that we mentioned earlier, which is the variable diffusion coefficient problem. So if you pick the implicit part to be constant coefficient diffusion and then leave the explicit part as everything else. Um, then, uh, and, and this is just one example where you have this coefficient D, which is just given, you know, for sake of arbitrariness as this, as this formula here, uh, you can compute the, um, the sigma. So in other words, what coefficient should you pick in front of the constant coefficient operator and what time stepping scheme should you pick so that your scheme is stable? And so it turns out that for first and second order schemes, you can always make, you can always make the scheme stable by picking a coefficient in front of uxx alone. But if you want to go to third, fourth, and fifth order, you actually need to pick the time stepping schemes coefficients as well. Um, and so you can do something similar uh, with uh, advection diffusion, which I'll show on the next slide. But just to summarize, uh, in a theorem, uh, it turns out that 
for, for a, an arbitrary diffusion coefficient, you can always choose the coefficient sigma in front of the uxx term so that you're unconditionally stable. Uh, however, generally speaking, third order uh, SBDF methods will not be unconditionally stable for any sigma. So in other words, you just can't pick a splitting that will give you unconditional stability for third, and, for third order methods and higher. Um, however, if you're willing to choose both the time stepping scheme coefficients and the splitting sigma, then you can pick both simultaneously in terms of known formulas in the problem to make the, to make the scheme stable. And so just to, just to highlight this, this is an example where we picked a variable coefficient diffusion problem where third order and beyond is not possible um, without actually doing the simultaneous splitting. And so, you know, essentially everything in this blue box is possible only if you're willing to modify the time stepping scheme coefficients and the splitting at the same time. Um, you can do something similar with variable advection diffusion. Um, due to the structure of the stability region, uh, the barrier does not occur at third order. It actually occurs at second order. And that's because the, um, the explicit term is uh, essentially gives, you, gives rise to skew symmetric matrices um, due to this UX term. OK, so um, I'm now going to move to some more realistic applications. So this is actually where the theory, uh, there's start to, there's, there will start to be a mix of statements that we prove rigorously and then statements which we essentially use our current theory um, as a proxy uh, to generate stable time-stepping schemes, where some theory is still uh, yet to be developed. OK, so uh, here's a nonlinear problem. So this is. Uh, uh, this is a nonlinear uh, diffusion problem where the diffusion coefficient depends nonlinearly on the solution. And so you might want to try and treat. So if, if you just treated this fully implicitly, then you, you essentially get a matrix which it depends both on uh, space and time. Um, so one thing that you could do is you could treat the implicit term with constant coefficient, uh, and then the explicit term is everything else. I, I wrote uxx term, and this really should be Laplacian. So th these examples are going to be done in higher dimensions. Um, and you can also pick, if you know something about the initial data or you know, have a rough estimate on what the maximum and minimum value of the solution is uh, for this problem, then you can, pick, uh, you can pick both simultaneously the scheme coefficients uh, and this parameter sigma so that you're unconditionally stable. And so here's just a, a visual example of of a solution of um, a solution that is diffusing nonlinearly in, into a box, and uh, this is just a comparison of um, we we did a comparison just on the computational time, the clock time, to compute a solution of the peak. So this is the the maximum value of the solution, watching it decay. Uh, the red curve is essentially the 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 largest time step one can get away with, with a you know, an accuracy that is say engineering precision. Um, you can still you can essentially solve the problem to fairly good accuracy with a time step that's like one over two fifty six, um, and then a reference solution you know we computed uh, essentially it ran overnight with a second order method. So, so you you do really get like significant speed ups when you go to these higher order methods um, with you know, semi-implicit IMEX type approaches. Uh, Dave, can I ask a question about this? So I would naively expect that initially the, for the smaller times, uh, the two would agree better. And over time you will, you know, that the, the, you will diverge from the uh, reference solution, right? If you use it larger mm -hmm. times. Then. Yeah, oh, that, that's a great uh, question actually. Oh, that, yeah, that's a great question. So. <laughs> Seems like yeah, so it's better it like way you're around. Getting, you're actually getting better, right? Right, um, right. Yeah. So the reason is, it's it's it. That's a great question. Um, it's it's actually an anomaly of the problem because this is a diffusion problem where there's like a global attractor. So right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So so okay. you're What's not. That? Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So, but it does it does highlight actually a failure of 
of this test problem as uh, you know something to showcase uh, the errors over long time periods. Yeah, that's that's a great observation, by the way. Right, right, okay. Yeah, th thanks for pointing that out. Uh, another thing I should point out too is that um, this is just to be honest with these methods that for this problem here, the nonlinear diffusion problem, one of the interesting problems you can have is when you have um, diffusion into a vacuum. So in other words, you have the solution rho being non-zero on some set, and then it diffuses into a set where it's zero. Uh, and in that case, you get you know, like Berenblatt solutions where there's a discontinuity at the interface. Um, these types of methods can be uh, made unconditionally stable for first and second order schemes, but then not, not unconditionally stable, at least using this conventional approach for higher order schemes. Um, but I would say that the Berenblatt problem it's because of the singularities, it really requires like its own special methods if you want to do higher order. Okay, so um, another example. So just going back, th this is uh, the original Navier-Stokes problem that I mentioned earlier in the talk. Um, and we can, now, we can now explain a little bit on why we saw what we saw with the instabilities. Um, so this is just a first order uh, IMEX I next scheme, you can do higher order methods. So this is the type of time stepping scheme that we're talking about. Um, now, formally, the problem comes from this interplay of the pressure, which can be thought of as a projection on the Laplacian in a certain way. So, um, so if you just look at the linearized Navier-Stokes, oh, actually up here, the linearized Navier-Stokes right here, um, the instabilities are actually gonna come from the interplay of the Stokes operator uh, where the pressure is treated explicitly and the viscous term is treated implicitly. It's actually not the nonlinear terms that is that are causing the instabilities uh, for this for this type of IMEX splitting. Um, so the, the difficulty is that you essentially have a matrix, which is the Laplacian being treated implicitly, and then you have a projection of that matrix that's being treated explicitly. And so when you compute the numerical range of this you know, splitting here, uh, or, and, and more specifically, if you compute the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues actually live in the interval zero to one, where they essentially go all the way up to one. And so what ends up happening is the numerical range and the eigenvalues, they live on this red line. And so first order schemes are gonna be stable because the red line is in the unconditional stability region. Second order schemes are also stable because you're in this unconditional stability region. Uh, but third order schemes are not stable because uh, the eigenvalues start to leave the unconditional stability region. And so this, and so it, it, it turns out that for multi-step schemes, uh, there's a, a sort of something similar to a Dalquist barrier that we can prove that um, says that the third order, or the, the unconditional stability regions are bounded strictly away from, from this point one. So, so really, uh, if you want to do splittings of this form, uh, then you know linear multi-step methods seem to have fundamental problems. Uh, so we we did look at uh, Runge-Kutta methods, and we looked at a similar dot, you know a similar model problem. And uh, in this case, we didn't in introduce new schemes. We just look, looked at pre-existing schemes, and then computed uh, similar types of stability regions. And uh, it turns out that there's an IMAX four four three scheme that. Uh, has stability properties that we like. And so, so we were able to run some higher order time stepping schemes for these types of problems here, uh, but we had to use Ranja Kutta schemes. And there's still some interesting theoretical questions that are currently open. Um, so in the last uh, five, 10 minutes of the talk, uh, I'd like to get into a recent application that we've been working on, which are the shallow water equations uh, and, and more specifically the dispersive shallow water equations. So, uh, so here's a, here's a figure. Um, so lambda is the characteristic wavelength of the, uh, of the height of the fluid field. Um, H is the height of the water depth. The, uh, the shallow water equations um, have the following structure. They look like nonlinear advection equations. Uh, we, we've essentially overused some variables here. So eta and zeta are essentially the same variable. Eta is the height of the water depth. Um, so I, I like to use eta for this, for this talk. Uh, so these are the standard shallow water equations. Now the shallow water equations are uh, formally um, Taylor series expansions in this small parameter. Uh, 
And so they're actually truncated to order beta squared. And so my collaborator and uh, colleague at NGIT, he's, uh, he has a, a wave tank uh, where he does experiments and he's involved in developing these types of models that include uh, terms that uh, go beyond just the shallow water equations. Now, what, what, what terms go beyond the shallow water equations? Okay, well, these, these PDEs, they actually go back, I mean, back to the 50s. Um, and we've scaled out beta here by a change of variables in, um, in the PDE. So if you look at this PDE, everything on the right-hand side, these are all uh, variables that would scale like beta squared. So these are like the next order corrections to the shallow water equations. Okay, so it looks, it looks, pretty, it looks pretty bad, but what, uh, what generic structure does this thing have? So, so a few observations. One is that the, um, uh, okay, uh, just before I go to the generic observations, uh, I'll just say that the reason why they're called dispersive shallow water equations is that if you linearize the system, instead of just getting omega is equal to absolute k as the dispersion relation, you actually get a one plus k squared on the denominator square rooted. So, so this, this PDE, the linearized version of this PDE has dispersion. So, so it's not just linear waves, it's dispersive waves. Um, so what, what are some of the uh, problems, numerically speaking, uh, that this this PDE system has. Um, so hey, how come incompressibility doesn't? Oh yeah, that's the, yeah, that's another like, good question. Just... So this velocity here, this is actually the depth average velocity. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I should have said that. So this this uh, the shallow water equations. The u is a depth average velocity. So essentially, what you're doing is you're going from a 3D fluid system to a 2D fluid system. Um, so you, you essentially gain like a, a reduction in dimension. Um, and instead of having a, a domain, so if you solve the full, the full 3D problem, which is also kind of interesting to think about, um, this problem would be 3D fluids with a, a computational domain that's changing because the interface is part of the problem. Uh, when you go to the shallow water equations, the interface, the height of the surface uh, water is a graph. It's a graph of a function. And the water is depth average. And so you essentially get two gains from a computational standpoint. Gotcha, thanks. So you got a dimension reduction and then you, your, your domain is now, your computational domain is like the, the X, Y variables instead of the X, Y, Z variables. Um, but let me, let me just add a few comments. So, this, so if you look on the right-hand side of this PDE, um, there are four terms that involve the variable du dt. And there's also mixed variables. So they've got spatial derivatives on du dt. So the terms on the right hand side have these mixed space time derivatives. So that's that's one um, uh, I'll say interesting aspect of this PDE. Another interesting aspect of this PDE from so both of these uh, will you know will lead to some interesting stability time stepping problems. The second aspect is that you have a third derivative. You have a third spatial derivative on the velocity here. And so, um, you know, at first glance, it looks like things might be hope, like you might just have to eat the third, third spatial derivative uh, cost, you know, if you treated things explicitly like a time step restriction like delta t to the h cubed. Um, so we don't have a full explanation on the, the second difficulty, but we have a we have a pretty concrete understanding of the first difficulty now on some ideas on how to resolve and, and come up with efficient time stepping schemes. So, so you can restructure, you can bring all the time step, the time derivatives du dt on the left hand side, and you can rewrite the uh, the PDE in the following form, where this operator g is just hitting the du dt. So essentially, we just bring all the right terms to the left hand side. And we group them all together. We call that G of U. Um, so this operator G, uh, we've decomposed it into two parts. There's um, there's a part that depends uh, purely on H, which is the bottom topography, the bathymetry. So if you have a flat bottom of the ocean, then this K term is identically zero, and you're just left with N. If you have a variable bottom, then you have this h, which is non-zero. So this operator h is non-zero. Now, these operators n and k, they depend on the solution, right? So they depend on eta, which is the height of the surface, the depth of the water. 
Um, H is variable coefficient, but it doesn't depend on time. Eta depends on both space and time. And we essentially want matrix-free methods that avoid inverting G. Uh, sorry, like we don't want to build G, for instance, and then have to like invert it. We want methods where we can apply G only. So in other words, we're, we're, we're perfectly happy to do matvex that involve G, um, but we don't want to do anything else. And so, uh, so the, the problem is uh, there's, there's two approaches that we consider. Um, one is essentially just a standard, conceptually standard time-stepping approach, like discretize this problem using uh, Ranjakata methods where the key challenge is finding a preconditioner for this, this, this matrix G, this operator G. So find a, find a good preconditioner for this thing that doesn't depend on space and time. Um, and then a second related approach is that we can actually do an IMEX multi-step scheme. Um, structurally, this problem is a little bit different because of the differential. We, we can recast this as a differential algebraic equation. So when you discretize in space, it, it has a structure of a differential algebraic equation. But it turns out these two problems, one and two, um, are essentially related. So finding a good preconditioner and finding good multi-step methods, the IMEX splitting, the implicit part of your IMEX splitting behaves very much like, or has a lot of similarities to a good preconditioner. So the term that you treat implicitly in an IMEX method, uh, there's similarities to what you would pick as a good preconditioner. Um, and the difficulty with the IMEX scheme is, again, zero stability. Um, so just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over some of the details because it's very yeah, similar. You're almost out of time, Dave, just two minutes. Yeah. Left. OK, so we, we end up getting stability regions, which are essentially equivalent to the prior ones. Um, so I think, I think the main message to take on this is that the, um, this operator has a variational structure. So the, this operator G, which is two parts, n plus k, it has a variational structure. Um, its, it's variational structure is, on, is naturally on um, a space, the space H div. And the, the variational structure of this operator G, it's essentially a symmetric positive definite operator G. Both N and K individually are symmetric positive definite. And I, I didn't write this out here uh, for the sake of uh, slides, but um, it turns out that this, this, uh, this variational structure, if you, do, if you rewrite it in the right variables, um, you can basically show that this, this uh, this G is positive definite. So you can, you can essentially write it like the sum of squares, similar to uh, the way that you write polynomials as sums of squares. And so if you estimate the quantities of the bottom topography and the, height, the, the depth of the water, it turns out that you can pick a constant coefficient operator um, on this H div space where the coefficients are known. Um, and then given this operator, you can bound the, the generalized eigenvalues of A and G. And so that's sort of the moral of the story is that we can find an operator A that's constant coefficient. We have formulas for the coefficients. And then once you have this operator A, uh, this the, the matrix G here is bounded above and below uh, by constants times this quadratic form involving the matrix A. And so what that means is the generalized eigenvalues of A inverse G are bounded below by gamma and they're bounded above by one, uh, where gamma is this formula here in terms of known quantities. And and uh, and then essentially we can you know we can use this we can use this operator as a preconditioner uh, to solve the full problem or we can use this operator as an implicit term in an IMEX IMEX time stepping scheme. Okay, and so we we have a few uh, visual examples here, um, but the uh, we also have some two D examples that are not currently shown, and so. Uh, just to summarize, uh, we've talked about an unconditional stability theory uh, with diagrams where the matrices don't commute. Um, and uh, we've looked at a few different examples uh, where the theory can be applied to various time-stepping problems. And we concluded with the shallow water equations, uh, which is still ongoing research, but uh, we have a manuscript in the late stages of preparation uh, that uh, should be out soon, hopefully. So I think that's just about it. And uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, let me